So um, it's a slightly unusual uh, word. So maybe I'll take a couple of minutes on the etymology. Uh, and it uh, comes to us from the Greek. And uh, it, uh, uh, it means uh, something to do with, uh, uh, ergon means something to do with work. And odos uh, means something to do with path. So as many mathematicians will uh, tell you, uh, all good things comes come to us from uh, physicists. So this indeed is also one of the subjects that comes to us from physics, mainly the work of uh, Boltzmann on the motion of gas particles. So Boltzmann was interested in studying the motion of gas particles and he perceived this motion to be a chaotic motion. And so uh, he formulated uh, what uh, came to be known as uh, Boltzmann's ergodic hypothesis. Okay, and uh, this ergodic hypothesis uh, in Boltzmann's language was more a philosophy than a precise statement. And it said the following, it said if you have a chaotic system and you don't know, you don't have a precise mathematical expression for writing down its laws of motion, uh, what you could expect if the motion is chaotic but still regular in some uh, range, is that uh, as the particle evolves in time, uh, it roughly spends uh, the same amount of time uh, in each uh, part of space. So the amount of time spent by this particle in a given uh, volume, say in that corner of the room, should be proportional to the volume of that corner. Okay, this is Boltzmann's ergodic hypothesis and ergodic theory is a, a mathematically rigorous uh, formulation of his hypothesis and related, uh, related facts. It's very closely connected to a much older branch of mathematics called dynamical systems, which one can trace back at least to Newton if not, if not earlier. And, um, in dynamical systems, one studies the motion of uh, uh, various uh, systems and uh, ergodic theory somehow uh, injects into the study of dynamical systems an aspect of probability. Okay, so it's the probabilistic study of dynamical systems and it uh, tries to predict long range behavior for systems that we consider to be chaotic. Okay, so in some sense, one should view ergodic theory as uh, some sort of mathematically rigorous attempt at understanding chaos. Okay, uh, a little more surprising is that uh, it's also uh, connected to uh, uh, other parts of pure mathematics like number theory. So this might come as a surprise. And indeed, uh, my uh, particular specialization is uh, in somehow connecting number theory to chaos. So let me uh, present you, uh, to begin with, an elementary example of how a subject like ergodic theory might interact with a subject like number theory. And so uh, this is a question posed by the famous uh, mathematician Gelfand. And it's a very uh, elementary question. It says to us, uh, why not uh, start by taking powers of a fixed uh, natural number, for instance, six. So let's start by taking powers of 6. So you take 6 to the 1, which is 6, and you take 6 squared, which is 36, and 6 cubed, which is 216, and then I don't know. And so Gelfand asks, well, uh, do you think there's going to be a power of 6 which starts with a 9? And if you present this question to a person on the street, they say, yes, why not? I mean, I can, after all, take infinitely many powers of 6, so surely at some point or the other, there's going to be a 9. So it turns out that you have to wait for quite a long time. The first power of uh, 6 that starts with a 9 is the 176th power of 6. Okay? So, oh, all right, that's good. So one success uh, under our belt, we found one power of 6 with a power of 9, which starts with a 9. And now the question is, how many are there? Okay? Are there 2? Are there 3? Are there infinitely many? Who knows? So, uh, to understand such a question, uh, one can reformulate this question in terms of a system which has a little bit of motion. 
So let me introduce this system by simply uh, reformulating the question. So uh, a power of 6 will start with a 9 only if uh, it's between uh, a 9 and a 10. Okay, so it's 9 times 10 to some power and time between 9 times 10 to some power and 10 times uh, 10 to some power. And now I can uh, do uh, what we all like to do, which is that we don't like power, so we take logs. Okay? We take logs and then there's this uh, uh, integer k, which I don't want to worry about. So I go mod 1. I drag it back to the unit interval. Okay? And then I have a very clean criteria for when something like this might happen. So uh, a power of 6 is going to begin with a 9 if and only if there is a n, an integer n, such that n log 6 belongs to some small subinterval of 0, 1. Okay, I want to analyze if this happens infinitely often. And to do that, I set up a dynamical system. So this is a dynamical system. It takes the unit circle, right? So you take the interval 0, 1 and you bend it so that 0 and 1 are identified. You get a circle. And on the circle, you consider the rotation by the number log 6. All right? So this is a system which is moving. And uh, we now understand the answer to Gelfand's question depends on whether while moving this infinitely often, I'm going to hit that small interval log 9, log 10 or not. Okay? That's the reformulation of the question. And this is exactly uh, the kind of thing that ergodic theorists like to study. So a mathematically precise version of, uh, of Boltzmann's ergodic hypothesis uh, was first arrived at by John von Neumann and subsequently by Birkhoff. And this goes by the name uh, Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. Okay, This is the statement. And let me explain to you what the statement is. It says uh, that uh, I'm taking a point in my space. The point is little x. And I'm going to move it around with a rule. The rule is the system uh, T, okay? In our example, it was uh, a rotation by log 6, all right? And it says that uh, as uh, you uh, keep uh, increasing the duration of the trajectory, it gets longer and longer, the time average, which is the left-hand thing over there, is going to converge to the space average, okay? So I can apply this, the system that we consider is actually ergodic and this uh, theorem can be applied. And when you apply it, you get that uh, approximately 4.5% of all powers of 6 start with a 9. Okay? So this is the kind of thing, uh, this is a, a simple example of how um, one can connect uh, the long-term behavior of chaotic systems with a question which is uh, purely number theoretical. All right, uh, so uh, let's uh, try to uh, move uh, ahead in terms of complexity. And so here's a picture, um, it's a little bit faint, I apologize for it, which is now trying to take the simple system that we had, namely the circle, and increase its uh, complexity. So this is uh, Poincaré's uh, disk. It's a negatively curved space is one of these spaces for which the parallel postulate of Euclidean geometry does not hold. So a lot of modern mathematics happens in this negatively curved space. And in this negatively curved space, uh, there are the semicircles connecting points on the boundary, which you can see. And uh, these semicircles are the geodesics on the surface. Okay? So what that means is, that in this uh, universe, where we to live on this universe, then uh, getting from point A to point B, so getting from that uh, green uh, patch there to the purple patch here, the best way of getting from green to purple is to actually go through the semicircle. That's the shortest distance. Okay? The shortest distance is not a straight line. Or put another way, this is what a straight line looks like in a negatively curved space. Okay. So the dynamical system that uh, one likes to consider, which also arose from uh, 
somehow uh, geometric uh, considerations is uh, to uh, look at uh, motion in uh, something called the hyperbolic uh, three manifold. So just as we took uh, the real space and uh, to the interval and identified some parts of it, we are going to perform a more complicated gluing and produce a three-dimensional surface where uh, uh, when you look, uh, when you zoom into the surface locally, uh, it looks like a little bit like this. Okay, so it's negatively curved. So we are very comfortable with the flat curvature because our world is locally flat. And we are also comfortable with positive curvature because if you draw a triangle on a balloon and then blow it, it bloats up. So we understand positive curvature. Imagine a, a geometry where instead of bloating up, it would curve inside. And this is the kind of geometry that we have. All right. So um, what happens, uh, a concrete example of the kind of space, an algebraic representation of the kind of space, is uh, to take uh, uh, the collection of all uh, n by n matrices with determinant 1. Okay. This forms uh, an example of an object introduced by the Norwegian mathematician Sophus Lee. It's called a Lie group. It, it has a lot of uh, interesting properties. The most important thing about a Lie group is that many Lie groups encode symmetries in space. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing is that it's a very interesting object because uh, it's an object which has a lot of rich uh, algebra and also allows us to do calculus on it in a way that the calculus and the algebra are compatible. Okay. So uh, the analog of the circle or the torus that we are going to consider is a quotient, is a gluing operation on the space of n by n matrices with determinant one. Okay. So it's a it's a space. It's a, a it's not a compact space like the torus. The torus closes up. This space doesn't close up. It has a, a closed part and then it has a part which goes off into infinity. However, it has a, what one calls finite volume. So it's still small enough for us to be able to do probability over. All right. And uh, on this space, there's a very rich class of uh, dynamical systems and these dynamical systems arise from the picture I showed you on the last slide where you look at motions on these geodesics or on those spheres at unit speed. Okay, so these are called the geodesic flows and the horocycle flows. Uh, they arise, uh, they can be represented algebraically as some sort of action on this space. So there is a negatively curved surface and you're moving on that surface in a specific direction at unit speed. This uh, motion can be modeled on this space, okay, in a, in a very precise manner. And a lot of modern uh, number theory has been, uh, uh, is basically uh, uh, involved studying uh, various structures on this space. All right, so uh, this gives rise to a very rich class of dynamical systems. And uh, let's uh, uh, try to uh, give you one example of a, a theorem that can be studied using these dynamical systems. So one uh, rather uncomfortable fact about uh, mathematics is the existence of irrational numbers. These things are not very nice because human beings like to think in discreetly. So natural numbers are fine. And if you really push us, we'll take quotients of natural numbers. But that's about it. We don't like irrational numbers. We can't write them down. However, uh, all is not lost because we can, in fact, uh, approximate them to a high precision with rational numbers. Okay, and this is very important in all kinds of uh, things. All right. Um, okay, okay. So basically, uh, let me try to speed up my uh, talk a little bit. Um, there are also numbers uh, which are very important in applications like in, uh, you know, putting satellites into orbit and in KM theory, 
These numbers are called Diophantine numbers or badly approximable numbers. So these are special numbers like the square root of 2 which don't admit very good approximations by rational numbers. So basically one of the uh, nice things about this ergodic theory is that it allows us to take one of these numbers, I can take one of these numbers, and associate to it a point on this 3 manifold. Okay? Uniquely, I can take a point and produce a point on this 3 manifold such that when I move the point along on this 3 manifold in this manner, I can model the process of getting good rational approximations to the real number. Okay? So it provides a geometric model of studying good approximations to a real number. Okay? So here's an example of a long geodesic on a quotient of that disk that I showed you. And this geodesic has a feature that it's bounded. So uh, remember that I told you the space uh, goes off into infinity. And this uh, geodesic is not allowed to do that. It has to stay in some compact part. And this happens if and only if the point that the geodesic started from is one of those badly approximable numbers, which uh, I told you about. Okay, so uh, basically there's a nice dictionary between uh, number theory and uh, chaotic systems. And then one can do a systematic study of this kind of uh, chaotic system to get results on the number theoretic side. I think I should uh, stop very soon. And uh, my recent work, which I uh, didn't mention, is a little technical to state. So I'm going to uh, try to just give you a, a brief uh, overview. So uh, basically, um, uh, if you know about, uh, remember about uh, Fermat's last theorem, uh, it has, it says, you know, you need to solve some equation, which is a polynomial equation. But the point is that you must solve it in integers. Okay, we all know how to solve polynomial equations in real numbers, but solving things in integers is very difficult. So uh, uh, solving something in integers is uh, equivalent to finding a point with integer coordinates on a complicated curve or a surface. And uh, my recent work uh, and ongoing work has been uh, to use uh, the ergodic theory that I just spoke about to produce uh, such points. So we want to produce points of given arithmetic complexity on, on surfaces and uh, higher dimensional objects. And this uh, uses a lot of uh, uh, interesting work, uh, including uh, uh, almost uh, very seriously the work of, uh, uh, of Harish Chandra, who is uh, one of our greatest uh, mathematicians and also a fellow. And uh, finally, there's a connection to a very big program in uh, number theory called the Langlands program. Uh, this uh, connects to one, one part of this uh, program. I think I'll stop.